everybody, my name is Boris. I'm a first year physician assistant student. Today I'm speaking with Sarah, she's a nurse practitioner, and we're gonna try to help you answer the question, what is the difference between a PA and an NP? Which career is better for you? And how are PAs and NPs changing the medical landscape? Sarah, thank you so much for sitting down and doing this interview. Yeah, thanks for having me. No problem at all. So just a quick introduction. Sarah is a practicing nurse practitioner. She also has a PhD in education and is involved in the education process at our local uh, NP program. So we're definitely gonna talk a little bit about that. But the first things I wanted to ask Sarah is just about you a little bit. Uh, when did you become interested in medicine? Um, well, actually it's over 25 years ago. Um, my friend oh, wow. and I decided to be a volunteer candy striper at a local hospital, you know, with the red and white uniform and, um, that kind of blazed the trail into nursing and medicine in general. I um, got to really love spending time with a vulnerable population in the hospital setting. So that started the process uh, of nursing and then finally nurse practitioner. Okay, how long did you practice as a RN before you decided to go on to be an NP? Actually, uh, I went to licensed practical nursing school first. Uh, mm -hmm. It just was more conducive to my work schedule, I was working and paying the bills on my own. So I did the uh, licensed practical nurse certificate and worked as a LPN in an office setting for a while going on for my RN. And um, by the time I was uh, an RN, I worked probably about four or five years as I'm going on for my bachelor's degree. Um, and then, you know, each step that I took, I spent some time in that role as an LPN, RN, bachelor's prepared RN, then uh, finally master's degree uh, nurse practitioner. So as each step went, I spent some time there and really uh, soaked up the experience in my clinical and school as far as that in my professional life as well. That sounds like a really long journey. Yes, very long. <laughs> so one of the difference between PAs and NPs, at least that I think of, is PA seems to be kind of a fast track. You know, you might work a medical job for a little while and then you go straight to PA. It seems like NP is more designed as you have experience in the field as an LPN, maybe then an RN, and then you finally go on to NP. Uh, is that usually how most people do it? Yeah, so to be a, a nurse practitioner, you need to be an RN, and to get into nurse practitioner school, you need to have some experience as an RN, and that's important. So um, that's one of the big differences. Although physicians assistants and nurse practitioners, we do the same thing. We diagnose, treat medical illnesses, we follow mm -hmm. patients, we prescribe medicines, and we order and interpret diagnostic testing. So I think um, the similarities are very important, but uh, the curriculum is different in that the nurse practitioner needs to be an R registered nurse first. So that's the biggest difference. Mm -hmm. More, mostly curriculum. Okay. And so I don't know if I ever told you this, but I considered uh, the NP route versus the PA route. And I actually looked at the University of Rochester program and they have an accelerated bachelor's, like when you have a bachelor's in a different field and then you can become an RN in one year and then you can go on to become an NP. I think it's like two more years. Uh, mm -hmm. But they did say that you have to work as an RN for at least a year before you can go back and get that NP. Yes, and a lot, a lot of the colleges around are doing that, uh, that accelerated for people who have a bachelor's in another field. So that's an option as well. Um, it, but there is a little bit of a break where you have to get some experience as an RN to keep, continue to go. So it's a, a little bit longer, I think you would say. Um, with the physician assistant, you, you, have, you, said, you mentioned medical, uh, some experience in medical. That that's mm -hmm. a necessity then? Yeah, so I don't know of a single program that doesn't require patient contact hours is what we call them. And that's usually a hands-on paid uh, kind of lower medical position like an EMT or a CNA or a medical assistant, mm -hmm. something like that. So that is required of every program that I've ever heard of, usually a thousand hours, sometimes two. Okay, so time-wise, time, time -wise, probably very similar though when you think about it, working as a year. man, getting the medical experience, that's, so that's interesting. Yeah, the only thing is you don't have to be an RN, you have kind of, you don't have to be that advanced of a medical provider. You could be like a, a medical assistant or a CNA or something like that. Oh, I gotcha. Okay. So it sounds like NPs start at kind of an average mm -hmm. higher level of uh, competence before they enter their training than PAs. Yeah, so, so you have to have associate's degree RN, but there's a new law in New York State with a BSN in 10, so you have to have your bachelor's degree um, within 10 years of getting your RN, aside from, you know, the master's degree. Oh, really? 
in the next um, probably about five years, um, entry-level nurse practitioner will be doctorate of nursing practice. So you'll have to have your doctorate to become a nurse practitioner. So that will change, not right now. You can become mm -hmm. a nurse practitioner with a master's, but um, it's going toward you know, entry-level DNP. I've heard about that. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of buzz in the PA community about possibly getting PAs to be a doctorate degree, but then it'll be confusing, like, are you the doctor? Are they the doctor? You're a doctor, but you're not the doctor. I just want to practice medicine. Exactly, exactly. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, so a little bit more about you. Uh, did you consider doing anything besides NP, maybe being a PA or a medical doctor, MDDO? Yes, I uh, considered going to physical therapy school and okay. medical school. But again, at the time, the schedule wasn't conducive to that type of um, program. So mm -hmm. that's when I did the uh, LPN, Licensed Practical Nursing School, because it was a half a day and then I could go to my job, you know, and pay the bills. Sure. But when you were switching to NP, did you consider maybe going on to any different kinds of schooling? Uh, no, only because um, I got my undergrad bachelor's from the same school that was offering the master's. So oh. I already yeah. um, knew the faculty. I was in mm -hmm. the area. So it uh, was very fluid to move into the master's program versus, you know, from the bachelor's because of that. Sure. So it was kind of like you wanted to do more with your career and be able to help patients at a higher level, but you didn't really want to move to a different state or anything for medical school. It was just very streamlined to go through the program you ended up going through. Right, exactly. Although, you know, graduate school was so challenging, but it made it easier because I knew, and more fluid, because I knew the faculty, I knew the program, and uh, I uh, felt more comfortable, I guess you could say. Okay, the whole thing was just streamlined, the stars aligned and everything. Exactly. Can't blame you. I feel the same way about the program I'm in right now. It's just like you knew them for several years, and you've been in the area. It's just like you trust them, you want to go to school there. Exactly. That's important. Mm -hmm. All right, so switching gears a little bit, as a nurse practitioner, could you describe a typical day in your life, if there is one? Yes, um, you know, as we spoke about earlier, I, I teach. I teach nurse practitioners and nurses. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I always say you have to practice what you teach. So um, I also see patients in the outpatient setting in clinic mm -hmm. and um, do that during the week, like one day a week. And then on the weekends, I round at the hospital as a nurse practitioner with my collaborating physician. So we see patients, we admit, we discharge, uh, do consults. Uh, I like that because I'm getting a taste of both worlds, inpatient and outpatient. We can bring that experience to the classroom with my students. So, but, uh, so it depends on the day. I do three different things, so it depends on the day. I might be doing a couple different things that day or um, all three. <laughs> sure. Can I ask you which one you like better, the inpatient setting or the outpatient setting? Well, yeah, it depends, actually. Um, <laughs> The hospital, you know, the, the patients aren't going anywhere, so I don't get nervous if I'm running behind. Okay. Um, in the outpatient setting, if, you know, somebody has a problem, I have to spend more time with that particular person. Um, I, you know, if I'm running behind, I get nervous. So that um, has its advantages and disadvantages. Uh, I never actually thought about that. You never have a waiting room backed up when somebody's inpatient because they're already, you know, they're mm -hmm. living there. For the time being yes, so. less pressure it's less pressure because I, I don't okay. like patients waiting that's my pet peeve okay I, I think i'd have the same one i wouldn't want people waiting and mm -hmm. then you also have a lot more available to you at the hospital more testing more uh kind of mm -hmm. specialty consults you can just get right there yeah that's a good point too in the outpatient setting you really have to uh think and and figure out what you're going to do, when you're going to bring them back. You're, mm -hmm. you're looking at the diagnostic testing that you might have done last week or the week before, and you're updating their symptoms. Maybe you haven't seen them in a couple of weeks. So um, yeah, that's a whole different ball game. You're right. Good point. Yeah. So your answer is you like inpatient a little bit better just because it's less hectic. Uh, you can do a little bit more and you don't have to wait for them or they don't have to wait for you. Yeah, it's not much pressure although we do get emergency so you know you think you have your day planned out and then you know three people are in the ER waiting to be seen so oh, wow. um, a little unpredictable <laughs> you know that's probably true the acuity of the patient who's inpatient is probably much higher than your typical walk-in ambulatory outpatient mm -hmm. person exactly so your day is a little more predictable in the outpatient setting yeah. and uh, inpatient you just don't you really don't know when you're going to be done with your day but that's right. okay 
Sounds like either one. You just don't really know what you're going to get. There's pluses and minuses to both. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Fair enough. And then as far as teaching goes, how does that work out for you day by day? Um, so day by day, I, I love it. And right now we have moved most of our, you know, all of our didactic portion and lab portions online. Oh, wow. Um, the recent COVID restrictions. So mm -hmm. that's been a challenge, but um, we're all adjusting and we're being more creative. Some people say you can't be present with your students um, if you're not in the same room with them. And um, we're really uh, proving otherwise. So uh, we're being there for our students um, in the asynchronous and synchronous way, but again, online and not in person. So that's been a challenge. Definitely. And how about seeing patients? Are you seeing patients mostly over telemedicine? Oh, good question. So, um, you know, if they're pretty sick, we bring them in still, although that's limited. Um, okay. We try to keep the telemedicines for not as uh, critical patients. Of course, they would come in or go to the hospital because the you know disadvantages of telemedicine is you're not able to put your hands on them. Mm -hmm. So um, we try to do the less complicated patients via telemedicine. So similar to what we're doing now, I'll have two screens, one with a video and talk and my headset, and then I'll be typing in the other. And um, you know we do a lot, we get a lot done. Patients are happy about that. Some people you know are 60 miles away, so they're very pleased that we could take care of some things over the video. Yeah. So in school right now, I'm a first year, so they're teaching us the whole, you know, history and then physical and then, you know, you do your assessment and plan, you base everything off that. Now your physical is taken away from you. Yes. So it's just like it's half the exam, but I guess for some people it still works out. Yeah, some people it does work out. Okay. So at the nurse practitioner program that you work at, you don't just teach, you're also involved in admissions. You were telling me earlier, uh, you actually interview quite a lot of the folks that you consider for the NP program. Could you tell me what you look for in a candidate to accept to your NP program? Sure. So there's an initial evaluation process where the potential student writes you know, an essay of why they want to go to NP school. Mm -hmm. um, they send in their transcripts. Mm -hmm. We look at their GPA, of course, and their involvement in the community around us. We get recommendations from their peers and other faculty, um, their previous managers. And we use that as an initial evaluation. Um, out of that group, we interview a select amount of people. And um, we look at that, but then we also ask the student, you know, how do you plan on going to graduate school? How do you plan on balancing work, life, family? We want to make sure they can do it. We want to make sure their, their head's in the right place. We want to make sure they're able to from their grades, but also with their motivation. It's nice to um, see the person, talk to them, meet them. I think that's important and just discuss the program. It's not just uh, asking the potential student, you know, what they want. We also tell them about our program because maybe they're interviewing in other places as well. So we want to make sure it's a good fit. I think that's the biggest goal. Make sure it's a good fit. Make sure they understand what the program's focus is. Our program is primary care focused. Mm -hmm. So someone that wants to go into anesthesia or in the operating room, it probably won't be the right fit. So uh, we just want to make sure we're all on the same page and uh, it, they're going to be successful. I think we really want to make sure of that. You know what, I'm glad you reminded me. I definitely, there's a lot there I want to explore, but the biggest thing is you said that your program specifically is primary care focused. With mm -hmm. PA programs, they're all generalists. You kind of specialize afterwards. Can you talk a little bit about different NP programs and what they focus on? Sure, sure. So um, yeah, this particular program is primary care, uh, mm -hmm. family nurse practitioner. So, you know, the hours in clinical are focused on primary care. There are some opportunities to do your clinical hours in specific specialties like women's health or cardiology, but it's not the majority of the hours. So that's important. And the didactic portion is also focused on that primary care. Um, other programs, uh, pediatric nurse practitioner uh, will be focused and you'll be certified in pediatrics. So the pediatric nurse practitioner wouldn't be able to work with adults, okay? okay? Family nurse practitioner, you can in fact work from cradle to grave. You can work in pediatrics, you can work with geriatrics. Um, you can even, in our state, you can work in acute care, but again, you're not certified in acute care, so you might see that down the road where there's going to be some um, doors closing for FMPs to work in acute care setting like the hospital setting. Right now you could, but in certain other states you can't do that. So it depends on the state you're with. 
Um, also nurse anesthesia, that's again a master's degree, working um, as an anesthesiologist. And um, there's a clinical nurse specialist, and there's adult nurse practitioner, adult Jerry, where you could only see adults and no pediatrics. So it depends on the focus of that program. So make sure when you're looking into a program, what is the focus? What are the hours for clinical? How is it broken down? You wanna make sure that you could keep an open mind. Like you said, you might specialize after. So I'm assuming you're gonna keep an open mind with your clinical experiences that maybe Definitely. your interest may change. Yeah, I think PAs kind of have more of an opportunity for that to kind of uh, drag our feet in what we want to specialize in and then change, you know, five, 10 years down the road. With an NP, it's, it's kind of more of like an MD where once you do your specialty training, you really have to get retrained before you work with a different population. Well, you know, again, like a FMP could work in different specialties, right. but um, you're going to see down the road that it's going to be more specialized, like you said. Mm -hmm. And that brings me to a PA. You, you could work in the OR as a first assist, right? Yes. Okay, so we can't, we can work in the surgery department and see patients outpatient or inpatient, but we can't go into the OR as a first assist. But after we, after FMP graduates, they can go to a different program and get certified as a first assist after oh, they get their FMP. So there's another difference there. It's a big difference. Mm -hmm. I also didn't know that because, I mean, everything you hear as a student, so much is coming at you, you never know what to believe. So I've heard in a lot of like surgical settings, PAs are typically like first assist. We might do some inpatient outpatient stuff, but mostly we're in the OR and NPs are mostly handling the clinic. Uh, but you said that you can get certified as an NP and also work in the OR. Yeah, we have an NP uh, that's uh, a faculty here and uh, he got his certification as a first assist. So he goes into the OR, he sees outpatient, he does everything. Okay. So yeah. What does the training involve? Like once you've already completed your NP training, you want to be a first assist. Is it like two months, six months, a year? I'm not sure exactly. It's, it's a few months. And then there's some clinical hours, of course, in the OR. You have to do so many hours um, in that role, of course. So I don't know sure. the details, but um, it's less than a year. Okay. So it's, it's not insignificant, but it's definitely not like a whole nother two, three year degree. Exactly. Yeah. It's very okay. um, doable. Well, I definitely learned something. So if you want to be an NP, but then you decide you want to do surgery, you could always get that as well. And it's not, you know, a huge commitment to go do more training. So that's cool. Exactly. So another thing is if you're an FMP, you just graduated, took your boards, now you're practicing in internal medicine, then you decide mm -hmm. you want to be a psychiatric nurse practitioner, you could go on for that certification. So you wouldn't have to do the whole program again. You do those oh. specific courses for that specialty, and then you'll sit for the psychiatric nurse practitioner boards. Okay. And those things basically just have everything that, like as an FNP, you didn't get trained for. So maybe it's a year or so, maybe six months, whatever the difference is. Exactly. Okay. Well, that makes sense. So I really didn't know that. You can kind of pick and choose. You just need a little bit more specialized training, which might actually be a good thing, to be honest with you. Yeah, because you have your core, your core classes, like your pathophysiology, your pharmacology, mm -hmm. you know, you have those, some of those core classes. So if you do go on for another specialty, some of those will be transferable in. Does that make sense? It does. It's kind of reminding me of like a Girl Scout or a Boy Scout belt. You just get your badges and you can get like all these different trainings throughout mm -hmm. your career and you can do all this different stuff. Yep, exactly. Well, that's kind of cool. I think with the PA field, it's it's kind of similar, but there's no structured training. There's more and more residencies coming out, but it's just like office specific. So it's basically just your resume. There's not as many like structured uh, trainings like for surgery and psych and things like that. So well, how many hours, how many hours of clinical do you have to complete? Uh, I think PA programs are required about 2000. 2000, okay. That's so we have a lot of different rotations, core rotations mm -hmm. like psych, primary care, uh, ER, all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely interesting. I didn't know all that about the NP route. Mm -hmm. That is interesting, yes. So another big elephant in the room is NPs by law can practice independently, PAs cannot. Depending on the state. But yes, yes like New York State, uh, you could practice independently. You know, I think it's important because let's pretend I'm working with a collaborating physician and that collaborating physician decides to retire tomorrow. Um, I technically can still work without the collaborating physician, and that's important, especially, you know, out in rural areas where there's no mm -hmm. primary care or there's uh, scarce primary care. I think it's important in that sense. 
Um, I, by all means, don't plan on opening up a practice. You know, I just don't have that entrepreneurship. Right. I like working with my collaborating physicians. I love teaching. I love doing all this. Uh, but people who do, that's certainly, I say, go for it. If you have a plan, a goal, go for it, and you could. So, for instance, your DEA license, the license that allows you to uh, prescribe medications, it does not have another physician on it. It's just yours? Right, correct. That's a big deal. I never thought of it that way. What is, um, what's the PA do? Uh, what do they do? How do they handle it? So a PA, you have to be hired by a practice and you have to have a supervising physician on paper before you can get your DEA license. Okay, I gotcha. So I never actually thought of it that way, what you said before, like if your physician, God forbid something happens to them or if they retire or something like that, you technically can't practice. You can't prescribe medications mm -hmm. until you have another one. It's, yeah, it's interesting. Um, very interesting, but uh, that's the utility I see of it. I don't, you know, as far as entrepreneurship, that might that's be something true. something else might do. I mean, I have heard of like PA run practices, but they have a physician on staff that basically signs off for them. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think you could have like an LLC with a yeah. uh, physician. Mm -hmm. I mean, anybody can own a practice. You don't have to be certified in anything, but if you want to practice in your own practice, then that's true. That's, that's where true. it gets messy. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's see here. So we talked about NP admissions, what it takes and kind of what you look for. Is there a personality type you think is really ideally suited for an NP career, at least in your program? Um, well, I would probably umbrella the NPs, PAs, the MDs, as far okay. as personality types, because you do need your, you know, group together because you need your clinical skills, you need your didactics. But as far as personality, I think that we all as providers need empathy, you know, and just being sensitive to what the patient's going through, especially our uh, vulnerable populations. Um, yeah. I think that's huge across all healthcare providers, that, that personality, you know, that caring, empathetic personality. Definitely. That's going to be number one, you would say, empathy? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's funny because the way that at least at orientation and like you ask a lot of PAs, what's a personality type of a PA? They usually jump to type A, get it done, get everything done. Uh, you know, just like responsible, motivated, mm -hmm. energetic. Empathetic is definitely in there. Maybe it's assumed, but the very first thing they say is you gotta be type A. That's interesting. So that's um, an interesting difference. Well, that's something I noticed we used to work together, Boris, as the audience might not know, but um, yep. that's something I noticed about you, how, um, very meticulous you were with detail, professional, um, on time, Thank and um, very good with the patients. Um, so, you know, I think that shows your personality and that's important and you're gonna have your clinical skills, your didactic, but if you don't have that, you know, it will be very difficult to survive in, in medicine because uh, sure. you have to be organized, you have to be paying attention to detail. I mean, these are patients' lives, so. That's yeah. a very positive attribute about you that I've seen before you went to PA school. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely think you can't be a careless person because one little, you know, 0 .01 on a lab value could mean if you're in the ER, life or death. Mm -hmm. So, then, yeah, I just don't see how you can yeah, practice so that, without that. Yeah, so if that comes out, I see. Exactly, exactly. It's important. Not everybody has that. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, just so the audience knows, yes, we did used to work together. I was a medical assistant in the practice that Sarah works at currently. So how do you see our current medical system changing and what role do you see providers like NPs and PAs playing in that change? Well, when I think about the future of medicine, um, the first thing that comes to mind is the shortage of primary care providers, uh, primary care physicians specifically. Yeah. especially in rural areas. So I see the physician assistants and nurse practitioners filling that gap. Uh, I see them filling that gap very well. And um, that's the biggest, biggest hurdle that I see. I also see nurse practitioners and physician assistants also being more, hol more holistic. We already are, but just uh, integrating other um, specialties within our practice, you know, like uh, in my practice, it would be lovely if we had a dietitian working closely with us and yeah. maybe an occupational therapist. So I see more of that, more interdisciplinary care. Um, I'm hoping that will continue. Uh, insurance is reimbursed for that care. 
Mm -hmm. So you're saying maybe more of a team aspect more than it is now? Yeah, so, you know, I, one, one point is my dissertation was how healthy behaviors help uh, patients. And, um, you know, the number one of the number, the highest thing is diet. So diet affects your health. And um, I can't even refer a patient to a dietitian without telling them, well, this might not be covered by your insurance. And you might be spending this amount of money, but it's really, really important that um, we, you know, you get some one-on-one -on -one dietary education. So I think that uh, insurance companies need to come on board with this interdisciplinary approach. Why do you think that is? Because diet is so important, at least for anybody who's tried to take care of their own health. Why do you think dietary, you know, dietitians just aren't as accessible or insurance just doesn't see them very highly or what's going on with that? I don't know. I, don't, um, I guess it depends. Um, I always have a problem I, um, with referring for a dietitian, for example. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure why they're not paying. I think it makes such a huge difference. Maybe we need to um, spend more time talking with these insurance companies and telling them yeah. how this would actually help them and save them money, prevent uh, hospitalizations down the road. Yeah. But um, I don't know. It's, it's mind-blowing. <laughs> Do you see us as primary care providers or I guess outpatient providers doing more of that counseling or is that just not something we can do, not in our scope of practice? Well, yeah, so, you know, I do a lot of education, um, mm -hmm. but there's always a barrier of time, you know, and especially an outpatient too. So I'd love to spend an hour with each patient, but um, that probably won't work out with the practice I'm at. And um, as far as uh, revenue, you know, we have to keep the doors open. So, and I understand that. Um, but I, yes, I love to spend more time with them, but that is a barrier. So, we, and we have patients that are sick that need to be seen. So you can't spend all that time educating. You do spend a little bit of time motivational interviewing and um, helping them formulate a plan. That's, that's what I, why I went to school. That's why I wanted to do this for. Mm -hmm. But it's not yeah. always realistic that you can spend as much time as you want with your patients. Okay. You said you were, you've been practicing for what, 20 years or so? Uh, going on 17. Going on 17? Okay, I rounded way up and I'm sorry. So well, 25, over 25 years in nursing, uh, but going on 17 as a nurse practitioner. As a nurse practitioner? All right, I'm gonna put it this way. From your quarter century of medical experience, do you think that, what percentage of patients that you see do you think would be conducive to keeping a food diary honestly and bringing it to you as a diagnostic tool? So I would say about 30% would do that because I've had to have them do, do that. Really? Um, who would it benefit? 100%. Yeah. <laughs> well, Sarah, are you ready for rapid fire? Sure, sure. Favorite food? Black olives. Black olives, just by themselves or on pizza? Uh, both. <laughs> oh, really? Okay, you really love black olives. All right, uh, dream vacation spot? Uh, Florida. We go to Clearwater, Florida every year. Okay, is that South Florida? Um, no, more on the uh, east. east. Okay, side. but it is by the ocean. Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. Okay, uh, favorite animal? Uh, cats. Cats? Mm -hmm. There's a cat tree behind me, but uh, the noodle cat's not in there right now. <laughs> She's usually here. Uh, iPhone or Android? iPhone. iPhone? All right, favorite 90s TV show? Well, you know, I'm dating myself because I am a lot older. So um, I go back to Three's Company days in the 70s and 80s. <laughs> okay. I don't think I was quite alive yet, but I've definitely heard of Three's Company. Yeah. I know the song. Yes, John Ritter. Yep. I didn't know that part. <laughs> All right. And last question. Uh, if a tree falls in the woods and nobody is around to hear it, does it make a sound? Uh, yes, it makes a sound. It does? Yeah. Okay. So the last person I interviewed on this channel was a medical student, and he answered that very technically. He said, well, yes, of course, it's not based on the observer, it's based on the frequency. I was like, okay, dude. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> he went all the way into the physics of it. Oh, I love it. But I guess so, it does make a sound. So he was right, he said you would say that. All right, well, Sarah, is there anything else you'd like to say to the pre-med, pre-nursing, pre-PA, uh, pre-NP students watching this? I'm grateful that you allowed me the opportunity to talk about our professions. I, um, you know, in an amicable way. I love that, and I'm I'm very passionate about physician assistants, nurse practitioners, MDs, PTs, all of us working in synergy. You know, and um, 
I want you to let you know that my primary care provider is a physician assistant. Really? Mm -hmm. And How does that I've, work out? Uh, all my providers along the years have been either a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant um, because you know I trust them. I know I'm going to get more time and oh. um, good one on one. I am very pleased with my PA. You know, I've heard that from a lot of people. They actually prefer having a PA or NP because we do have a little bit more time for them. We actually listen. I've heard that too. Mm -hmm. So, yep. you know what? That's a really good thing to say. And definitely thank you for coming on. Thank you for doing the interview. Uh, the reason for this is the last person I was consulting said there is a million PA versus MD videos out there, but not a single PA versus NP video. Interesting. Okay. Good. Well, I'm glad we did this. Me too. And I definitely learned something. Yes. See, I'm going to go back and be a nurse practitioner now. Don't tell my program. <laughs> and I'll be a PA. <laughs> hey, there we go. We could do that. <laughs> Just swap programs. So again, thank you very much for coming on and hopefully we'll do this again. All right. Thanks, Boris. Take care. Bye.